and it's really been enjoyable listening to, you know, to all the different perspectives, uh, you know, on asset mapping. And so, but, so I'm the entertainment value while you need to take a lunch break and, you know, answer emails. So you can kind of put me in the background there. Uh, it's very much a, a story about how we started an aerial cinema and ended up in airborne survey and how our company has pivoted through the times and used a lot of the same skill sets to move our way from uh, doing a lot of aerial cinema to doing a lot of survey. Uh, so the first part will be a, a little bit of a journey. Uh, I'll call this from the Arctic to the Amazon. Uh, it's really almost the Arctic to the Antarctic. Uh, I figure since we're only a few hundred miles from the North Pole, you should be wearing Christmas colors. Uh, this is with a, a photo from a National Geographic documentary that I did uh, for Pristine Seas. Uh, we're actually standing on an ice flow that three weeks later was completely melted uh, with narwhals moving through it. And this is Theo, who is, is one of our guides. Uh, this is up, uh, Lancaster Sound is to our left there. Uh, so in the aerial filming world, really privileged to see just amazing parts of, of the world. And now uh, this is our polar bear whisperer shot, uh, shot with a long lens actually in, in slow motion as that uh, beautiful bear just jumped from one ice flow uh, to the next. Uh, a subtitle for, my, for this discussion actually could be from polar bears to power poles. Uh, and a lot, we really had the privilege again of working with amazing clients, uh, National Geographic, PBS, Discovery, BBC, Smithsonian. Uh, these were the nature documentary clients. In addition, we had uh, a number of projects for anything from goofy reality shows to, uh, to feature films. I won't tell anybody we worked on Bachelor. Uh, also, uh, among those privileges, I was working with uh, Sir David Attenborough on a number of films, uh, one up in Canada called First Animals. Uh, so I'm uh, talking to Sir David here about, about aerial film, and we try to have him, you know, get a go at the, uh, at the Cineflex equipment that we were using. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move south a little bit uh, to Colombia, where we have been uh, filming probably for a good seven or eight years or now. And that filming has started to morph into doing using LIDAR uh, to explore uh, and look for, you know, hidden cities and archaeological wonders. Just in a, uh, if anyone has not been to Columbia yet, put it on your bucket list. Uh, so in part of that, we're, we're flying in this amazing park uh, in the southern part of Columbia. It's uh, 14 million acres. It's now a UNESCO site uh, by the name of Chiribacchetti. And every time we go there, we would take the camera and search around these tapuis or buttes and find cave paintings or paintings that were on the wall uh, that we had never, you know, that literally no one, there are like three people in the world that know where some of these locations are. Just a really, again, cool discovery part. Uh, from there, we'll go slightly uh, out into the uh, into the Pacific, uh, worked again on a really cool project in the Galapagos. Uh, seeing the world at 500 feet and below, or a thousand feet and below, it, it's just amazing. You know, usually we're looking out of jets. Uh, in other days, crossing you know crossing the country, crossing the world, and we spend our life uh, in aerial filming at at 500 feet and below. Uh, so. For the Galapagos, of course, is an incredibly protected place. So our home uh, for two weeks was on this ship, kind of like a, a, a heliport and a hotel all put together. Uh, if you can look underneath the helicopter, there's actually 10,000 gallons of jet fuel stored here. So we could uh, land on the ship, uh, certainly sleep and eat on the ship, download our data, and then refuel the helicopter. Uh, on the nose, you'll see the, the camera system that we were using. Now, from there, we'll keep going south, uh, this time in Patagonia for a, a BBC project. We use a stabilized camera system. There are several out there. Uh, essentially, the, there's five or six axes that are gyro-stabilized. And what that means is the, 
there are two outer axes that allow us to tilt the camera up and down and then pan the camera left and right. And then there are three more axes inside it. So no matter how bumpy the helicopter is, the picture is actually just rock solid. Now, we, we did not work on planet Earth, but we started in business like a year after planet Earth came out. It was, it was the perfect time uh, to get uh, into the aerial filming business as everyone had in the world really had just seen planet Earth and wanted to have those type of aerials in their films. Uh, in, as part of that uh, project, I had to throw in my, my Top Gun um, moment here. Uh, we were, I'm flying with a Chilean pilot, uh, Pablo Blanco, and it took us, we were in Punta Arenas, and we needed to go down to Puerto Williams. It's about a hour, about, about a two hour uh, flight by helicopter across a lot of water. And the weather reporting is not that good. So I kept, and we had been, you know, working on this project for, you know, for months, getting ready for it. And here we are stuck in Punta Arenas where it's absolutely beautiful skies. And I'm asking Pablo, can we go? Can we go? And he's like, no, not sure about the weather, not sure about the weather. He just kind of kept us up for a couple of days while we we're waiting around. And he said, Ron, where we have to go is through Death Pass. We don't have enough fuel to turn around and come make it back if we can't get through. And I'm like, okay, whatever you say is good for now. <laughs> so we ended up in Porto Williams. Um, here is, if you, if you don't mind, I'll play about a, a two minute video or so of some of the behind the scenes for filming this mini, the Patagonia mini series for uh, BBC. <laughs> Thank you. 
the important part about watching that film is is not the the technology you can see it, we had the gopro you could kind of see the helicopter moving around and then what the stabilized shot looked like so it's not the technology not these incredible locations but the team of people that really pull this together so everything we do is about uh, good teamwork, good planning, good logistics uh, to get there and make something happen. Uh, an example of that would be if we're working on a feature film, we, we worked on, say, example, Fast and Furious, uh, you know, over in uh, the UAE, and you've got, you know, all the cars, the stunt drivers, the actors, extras, a location that's been locked down or a road that's been locked down, and you just don't tell the director that, oh, I'm sorry, I got, got a problem, I can't can't work right now. Uh, so that that really uh, helped us take logistics and make it part of the DNA of our company to just, you know, make things happen and not only to have a plan A and B, but a plan C, D and E. Uh, so we'll keep going uh, just slightly more south on that same project, Cabo de Hornos in Chile, the, uh, you know, the southernmost uh, point of South America. Uh, if you went to the left, the next stop is Antarctica. Uh, so we're seeing all these beautiful locations and I would get back and I would, you know, show a few clips. And the first question that everyone said is, where is that? And it drove me to really start thinking about that question of where is that? Where am I? Uh, so we uh, had started to develop a, a system that would allow us, uh, and this is, you know, five, eight years ago uh, to track exactly where we were flying and we would record a, a, um, a mark every one second. And then uh, in video language, we would take that timestamp from the GPS signal and take that timestamp and, and make it the video time code. So we could then link up our KML with the video to every one second. So for example, what you're looking at is a KML on top of Google Earth. Uh, that is Cabo de Hornos, and that is the flight path uh, that we flew. Uh, again, this is the, the be prepared part is uh, the this, this storm that you, uh, you may have seen in the background there. It actually had just started sprinkling. It took us 45 minutes to fly out there. We got literally one, one take, about 15 seconds, then we had to, had to head back to, to beat the storm. Uh, the next is, you know, we're still, uh, you know, pretty close to sea level. We're, this time we're somewhere uh, over the Atlantic Ocean, about 200 miles northeast of Cape Canaveral. So you can probably guess what we're doing. Uh, here is uh, inside the airplane. So we use both uh, helicopters and airplanes, uh, for the most part, uh, helicopters. Uh, the only part you can see here of me are my, uh, my two knees. And I have the, uh, what they call the laptop or control board for the gyro stabilized camera that's mounted uh, on the nose. We have our pilot uh, and an engineer. We each have monitors so that we can see what the camera is seeing. And if you kind of look in close here, you'll see some data on the screen. So our mission uh, over a couple of years was to document and bring back, uh, you know, at both evidence and research, and finally, uh, the images of the first successful SpaceX landing on an autonomous ship. So how do we do that? This is uh, kind of a twist and an advance on the, the where am I. Uh, in this case, we were able to uh, have the KML of the exact uh, projected flight path of this returning stage. So if you look at the red line, that is actually where that stage is supposed to go. And this is uh, the stage coming back down through the earth doing its, uh, its major slow uh, burn to slow it up a little bit. If you look our slant range, so from slant range is the distance from the camera or the airplane um, to this location or to this target. Uh, so we're what, I think that's like a good six miles um, away from the actual uh, rocket. We're in, a, in an airplane moving at 100 miles towards the rocket, 
and the rocket is telling us where to look. Oh, by the way, no one is steering the camera here. This actually was uh, auto, uh, the data, the rocket is throwing the telemetry uh, to the airplane telling the camera where to point. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the behind the scenes looking the other direction, the pilot on the right and the engineer on, on the left from SpaceX. Uh, to receive the telemetry from the rocket, which we started to receive as soon as it was above the horizon uh, through a series of antennas uh, into a laptop with some code. The important part here is that those antennas are bolted to a $6 uh, plastic cutting board. Uh, so we use high tech whenever possible. And this is the, uh, the moment after the landing. Uh, one of my colleagues was actually the, um, the cinematographer in that. So uh, some of our crew are, are right here in, in this crowd uh, at the SpaceX headquarters watching it watching the rocket land for the first time. Uh, however, building up to that first landing, not everything went so well. Uh, and these are all uh, uh, screenshots taken from the, uh, the bloopers uh, YouTube that SpaceX has put out. Uh, so as you can see, they, they don't all end well. Uh, this was one where the, uh, the stage almost made it and then uh, tipped over. And I thought we would uh, do just a little technical discussion here. Uh, I learned early on that rockets don't explode or blow up. Uh, they experience a rud. And that rud is a rapid, unscheduled disassembly. Uh, should, should come in handy, you know, if you're uh, working up on a, on a fix-it project. Doesn't quite come out right, it's a rud. Uh, the next project, so we're going to go from uh, sea level up a little bit higher, uh, this time to Mount Everest. Uh, where base camp is around 17,000 feet. Uh, Mount Everest is this peak uh, up by my cursor and the Kumbu Icefall. We were there uh, on behalf of a really large uh, science project uh, about exactly a year ago. Uh, they had a number of scientists. They were setting up uh, the world's highest uh, weather station. They also took a 10 meter core of ice uh, from somewhere up in this area that they took back and cut up and labeled into different sections to send out to scientists around the world with the theory that the gas bubbles that were trapped inside that 10 meter cube of ice, uh, once analyzed those gas bubbles could begin to paint a history or a timeline of carbon over the planet for the last thousand years. I don't know who thought of that, but incredibly brilliant and just a, you know, privilege to work with, uh, you know, people and scientists like that. Our part was to create a base map of the glacier. Uh, the glaciers in that area uh, are retreating at a incredible rate. Uh, this is the aircraft that we use, Mount Everest in the background and the scanner. I'll get a little bit uh, more detail here on the, on the LIDAR scanner in a second. Uh, we're using a aircraft by the name of an Airbus, AS350, uh, B3, and E. Uh, when we're doing this type of work, uh, where we arguably set the, the world's highest helicopter LIDAR scan, the helicopter has basically all, anything unimportant stripped out of it, extra seats, extra padding, uh, and we only are going about half fuel to keep the helicopter light. Uh, up to around 22,000, 23,000 feet uh, above sea level. Uh, so maps are not new. Uh, we, we're there in, you know, in Mount Everest. Uh, you can see it here, see some of the ice fall. Uh, this is a map created in 1921, which is incredibly accurate, uh, you know, even today. So but we're using slightly newer technology. Uh, we have, we use three, uh, components from three uh, manufacturers that all work together. Uh, one of the most important pieces is the IMU. Uh, so we're using an Aplanix AV610 IMU that is then connected to the Regal uh, VQ480 scanner. And that is also connected to a four band 100 megapixel phase one camera. Uh, we built, because of the very 
steep walls of the Kumbu uh, Glacier there, we built this mechanism uh, that we ended up calling the LIDAR rotisserie uh, because we could not only point the scanner down, but when we got into areas with a really tight wall, we would tilt the scanner either at 45 degrees or at a 90 degrees to be able to photograph and paint the walls uh, with LIDAR points from the scanner. Uh, here's a result of uh, some of the data. The, the top part is of uh, the base camp that is at uh, 17,000 feet. Uh, what you see in the top here are actually uh, the prayer flags, you know, running in between all of the different base camp tents. Uh, so, so think of the, the amazing resolution that the LIDAR system can provide. The, uh, the lower image, every color represents a different scan. So we did at least a 50, 60% overlap and then multiple scans to pick up data from every different angle. Uh, inside, uh, Phil Carter is our uh, aerial systems, uh, aerial operations director. So Phil was up there. They're probably in the, uh, you know, in the 17 to 20,000 foot range. Um, our pilot, you can see there's no other passengers. Uh, They've, uh, this bottle here is oxygen. Everybody is on oxygen and not sure why, but Phil's wearing a short sleeve shirt at, at 20,000 feet. So it couldn't have been that cold. Uh, all of the acquisition is done uh, off, runs into and is controlled by a laptop uh, running the, the various software from Aplanix and Regal and phase one. Another behind the scenes, this is uh, the gear that we show up with uh, into, uh, in this case, into Kathmandu to work on the, the Everest project. International shipping allows you to uh, access or check as excess baggage, any case up to 32 kilos uh, or 70 pounds. So we get our cases right to 69 and a half pounds each and check everything uh, as excess baggage so we went from Los Angeles to Hong Kong to uh, Kathmandu and had probably about 15 cases of gear that, that needed to get there. Uh, next we'll, we'll move just slightly uh, up or slightly down in altitude to the, uh, the Kilauea volcano. This is in 2018, uh, right after that, that major earthquake uh, this is uh, Fisher 8. The, the fissures were named sequentially as they popped up. Some of them kind of fizzled out. This is Fisher 8 that was at its peak, I believe gushing something like 30,000 gallons of lava uh, per second. Uh, we were uh, in this image probably 2,000 to 2,500 feet uh, above, and the, the heat off of there still rocked the helicopter, you know, back and forth. Uh, again, uh, Phil going from the, uh, you know, the mountains in, in Nepal to uh, over top of uh, the volcano. Uh, always lots of safety protocol. Uh, we're, not, we're not trying to look like the Top Gun guys. We're just trying to, uh, you know, make sure that everybody is safe and, you know, and doing the right thing. and. While everything we do sounds extreme, there's an amazing amount of planning. And again, on the safety side, even a, you know, the plan A, the plan B, the plan C, where we're going, what's the protocol and everybody's role uh, within that mission. Uh, so why we're there, we, we went uh, and worked with another survey company by the name of uh, Quantum Spatial, uh, who had been contracted by USGS uh, with FEMA looking on. Uh, this residential area uh, was built probably 40-ish years ago or so. Uh, it turned out that uh, it was built right over this, uh, the Southwest uh, Rift Zone. Uh, probably not a good day for, you know, for this person here. Uh, this was at 6.9 earthquake um, on the, you know, on the 4th of May in 2018. You can see the destruction, you know, a, a fissure would have popped up here and, and obviously the heat, um, you know, took down this house. This house had the fissures directly or the faults directly underneath it. Uh, so what's really interesting and amazing about LIDAR and, 
you know, going from that sense of discovery of filming a cool location to seeing, to knowing where that location is, to finding out what's underneath it is how light are by throwing out millions and millions of points of light, enough points can get through even the densest canopy to be able to allow the creation of a DEM. This jungle that you're seeing is less than a mile away from where that lava, it was gushing out of Fisher 8. So if you just watch slowly here, we're going to transition from just a color picture to the DEM that was created from the LIDAR data so that the scientists could begin to see what was beneath that jungle and where the the new faults may have been in reference to old faults. Uh, so the theory here is that uh, these larger uh, sort of lines were older fissures where the land had come together and that the thinner dark ones were where the new ones had, had pulled apart. Just, just amazing to even think that this is under there. I'm gonna, we'll go back uh, to that jungle shot and then transition to does, the question is how do you see through the jungle? And it's not, or through a heavy canopy, and it's not that the LIDAR can actually see through the canopy, it's if you think of you're walking through the deepest forest and look up, there is still light coming through that canopy. And we get, in this case, if we look at uh, this diagram, the yellow line, it represents a cross section, and then in the pop-up window, we have the graphic of that, uh, of that profile. So the, the green uh, is the area through here. The brown or orange is actually LIDAR points that were identified as ground. And then the uh, algorithm put together this data in order to uh, create that slope shade and create that profile or uh, bare earth DEM model. You can see how this area, there's no trees above. We have very dense LIDAR points represented by the, you know, the orange brown. And then as we get under the canopy uh, back in this area, we're seeing far less points on the ground, but there's enough points and enough last returns for uh, the algorithm to run that bare earth model. Uh, in, in some cases in the densest of jungle, we're only getting about a 4% success rate of points that actually hit the ground. So starting out with a lot of points is a good thing because you're gonna end up with, if you're only gonna end up with 4%, you need as many outgoing points as possible. Uh, so back to the, uh, the, the volcano again, uh, and or back to the big island. This represents a uh, change detection. So the, the orange data was collected in 2006. Uh, there just happened to be an existing data set that was done in that area. Not fully analyzed, but uh, existed. Uh, and the multicolored Christmas lights are the ones, is the data from 2018 that we collected. You can see the difference between the roof of the house in orange uh, from 10 years ago and the roof of the house. So this house during that earthquake essentially moved three to four feet uh, to the east and dropped down about a half a meter as well. It's so essentially the address of that house changed with that earthquake. Uh, if you look over to the far right side, the earth was continuous in uh, 10 years ago, represented by the orange, and the multicolored points are actually where our scanner has pushed points into the ground. I'd like to you know, emphasize that you can see how the value of data increases over time. Uh, first of all, because that data now can be compared to a new set of data and change uh, detected, or if you have repetitive sets of data, now you can start to create trends. Uh, in addition, the algorithms that and the software applications that are run on LIDAR data get better over time. So we're beginning to see change detection that we never even thought possible a year or two ago. 
uh, my, my argument would always be if you have a chance to acquire uh, high resolution LIDAR image data, go for the absolute best resolution possible uh, because it will become more valuable over time. Uh, and then we'll see uh, again how that DEM uh, comes into play. This is a project in Colombia at a, a historical archaeological site by the name of Ciudad Perdida. Uh, the site was discovered in the 1970s and you know restored over the you know 20 years after that. And you can see uh, the uh, the different platforms um, that that civilization had from say I think 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. This is, uh, if I believe you can pick it up on Disney Plus, it's the National Geographic uh, Lost Cities series with Albert Lin, and it first aired in October last fall. So what we did, we were, we were commissioned by uh, National Geographic to do a LIDAR scan and work again as a team with the archaeologists to identify potential sites where they thought they might be able to find uh, additional civilizations, but had never been able to uh, hike in to see anything at all in the in the 30, 40 years that they knew about the you know the potential sites. Uh, this is where the um, you know the helicopter landed. If you look closely, you can see one of our scanners on the nose. Incredibly rugged terrain. Uh, this is where that you know we only got four per, you know four percent of the returns uh, from the laser uh, you know sent back up to the helicopter. Uh, this ravine is about a thousand feet below the, uh, the helicopter. So the first thing we did was to scan the ridge of that known and restored area. The, for reference, the helicopter is parked about in the center here where the red dot is, uh, higher elevation going down to lower elevation. So we then uh, did a LIDAR scan of an adjacent five mile valley. So we've got roughly five miles from, you know, from right at the lower elevations up to the left. Uh, in a, we did one scan, took about three hours, two and a half, three hours of helicopter time, and then processed the data first into a uh, digital elevation model and then ran a slope shade analysis on it. And the archaeologists looked at it and were able to identify uh, seven to eight additional uh, lost civilizations from 3,000 years ago. So if you look at the, the top of each ridge, you begin to see the same shapes, uh, although 3,000 years later, of you know, trees growing on them, of what could have been uh, platforms. So now the plan is to you know, be able to hike into these locations and we will be able to give them very precise locations of where to look for these potential archeological sites. Uh, but uh, Chris Fisher, who, who spoke yesterday, said, you know, I don't care about the trees, throw away all the trees. Well, if we throw away all the trees, those, that data alone of trees is a lifetime of work for a biologist or a botanist uh, and with the intense amount of data and returns that we're getting, we're, we're actually able to see pretty well the shapes of these trees. We can see the trunk and the limb structure, you know, obviously, a, you know, one type of palm, another type of palm. And because that LIDAR data is so accurate and has about a 15 millimeter uh, repeatability for its um, relative accuracy, uh, and we can get the absolute down to a one to three centimeter range, that LIDAR data can be used to measure uh, an urban forest. So I've pulled, this is in Los Angeles, I've just pulled a, uh, the palm tree off of Street View uh, in Google Earth, and then we've gone and measured the, you know, the height of that tree, the crown diameter. Uh, we calculated uh, the uh, trunk, um, diameter and then did the math to come up with the circumference of this palm tree. So just an infinite number of ways to, to use uh, LIDAR data. Uh, and ending up, uh, this is a quote that's been a favorite of mine probably for 30 plus years, uh, that the voyage of discovery is not in seeking those new lands, but seeing with new eyes. 
and this quote today to me even seems more important than it did 30 years ago as you know perhaps our our travel uh, is a little more restricted and we need to look at the same landscapes that are outside of our door with new eyes new ways to uh, create data analyze that data and use that data and thank you very much i, I appreciate the time Thank you, Ron. Uh, that was that was infotainment, but that was also there is uh, plenty of technical content there, and uh, some people are going to have questions on that. Uh, on an unrelated note, I have to thank you for something. So, my son is a uh, a new filmmaker, and he never showed any interest in geospatial things that his dad does, but he's a big fan of your work. So, thank you for planting geo in my son's mind <laughs> You're welcome. and if, if you need an assistant he's <laughs> anyhow um a question somebody had you you mentioned dr fisher but uh have you um are you working with or have you know cross projects with the the earth archive folks uh, we are in continual discussion uh, it's you know it's a fantastic idea and we're uh, looking at ways where data that we acquired uh, whether it was on our own nickel or for clients uh, that could be incorporated into, you know, our earth archive to, you know, help things get started. Okay, excellent. And a uh, couple of semi-technical questions. Uh, somebody wants to know, uh, do you, uh, do you use UAV platforms sometimes? You know, we have a UAV. We've, uh, we've done one camera project with it about two and a half years ago. Uh, and it's been on the shelf ever since. We've been absolutely swamped with uh, helicopter work. Um, so it's it's a matter of uh, sort of different tools for the job. And we see uh, UAS as just another platform. So whether you are starting out with mobile mapping, you know, on a vehicle, on a drone, on a helicopter, on an airplane, uh, it's just a different it's a different platform. And there's a really nice mix between where the, the drone can go and where the helicopter takes over and then merging those data sets together. Okay. Yeah, I actually saw a really interesting uh, drone activity. You were talking about the, uh, the canopy in the, in the, uh, in, in the tropical areas in the, in the rainforests where they had run a drone underneath uh, as well yep. to, to pick up. So uh, you sound like you're swamped with, with uh, well, with science uh, projects and entertainment. Uh, uh, are there any like, uh, you know, commercial design construction type projects that you take on? Uh, yes, so we, um, we actually over the last five years or so, the, our filming work used to be about 80% of our um, business and now that's completely changed. So it's probably 90% uh, aerial airborne survey. Uh, of that, a good two thirds is in the electric corridor. So we're doing okay. a lot of uh, vegetation management, wildfire mitigation, uh, and then uh, we're taking on more projects for, uh, for cities and urban areas. We're quoting a 25 uh, square mile you know, city right now uh, to do very high resolution data where we can scan from multiple angles and do uh, multiple looks with the camera as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, I know. Building digital twins. Yeah, that that was what it. That was the buzz term. I I, I uh, you know look at projects where they're trying to build a digital twin of, of a city, and uh, especially in the in the heavy urbanized areas, the helicopter is quite popular because you can get in and around, uh, in in the in the high de high detail with the heavier cameras. So, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you have anything, do you have any uh, exciting projects on the books that uh, we might be seeing? So, you know, honestly, everything we do is exciting. And, you okay. know, it's just, <laughs> and it's because we love data and we love just looking at new ways to bring, you know, solutions to clients. So, and it's that, and we, we look at a scanner and go, well, what if we turned it sideways? What if we turned it upside down? What if we added this to it? So it's taking, uh, what we'll call off the shelf sensors and figuring out new ways to use them and, and new ways to make that data valuable and useful. Okay, great. Well, th well, thanks again, Ron, for, uh, for joining this, uh, this event and uh, being our special guest speaker for today. 
Uh, we'll be looking for more of your work out there. And uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you about projects or anything else, uh, you know, they can go through the, uh, the guidebook. So thanks, Ron. Uh, oh, thank you.